A government pledge to spend billions of pounds improving transport outside London. England's city regions will get the cash to improve services as part of the Chancellor's budget next week. Get your booster jab, say ministers, as a top government advisor warns COVID infection rates are unacceptable. The world's biggest oil exporter, Saudi Arabia, says it wants to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2060. Good afternoon. The Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, is promising to spend almost £7 billion improving transport outside London in England's city regions. It's one of a number of spending pledges to be unveiled in Wednesday's budget. He says a transport revolution will bring public services around the country in line with the capital. Labour says the government lacks a coherent plan to transform regional economies and tackle the climate crisis. Here's our business correspondent, Katie Austin. Whether it's for work or leisure, how easy is it to get about where you live? Greater Manchester is one area set to receive cash to spend on transport improvements, such as tram upgrades and bus corridors. I think it's going to be a great idea for Bolton, and it will save time on people like using buses and trains. Direct links to it in and be it properly for the environment as well. I'm not usually in Bolton, like I'm more in Preston, but if there was a convenient uh, tram from Preston to Manchester, I, I'd definitely consider it. It'll be for regional authorities to decide exactly how the money is spent. This is not a day for any negativity. It feels like a real breakthrough for levelling up today. The government feels as though it's listening and buying in uh, to, the, to the Greater Manchester vision, so it's a good day. Next week, the Chancellor is expected to confirm £5.7 billion for a range of projects in England's big city regions, one and a half billion more than had been anticipated. It's meant to help bridge the gap between transport provision in the capital and other places. The bar next door used to be part of the same. Including the West Midlands. At this cinema in Digbeth in Birmingham, staff think better local links would be good for business. It would be a great help, again, not just for the customers, but for the staff as well. They're coming from all over and it's, you know, an important job to them and it would just make life a lot easier. A lot of the time they're just having to get taxis home or things like that, whereas a tram would be great, you know, to kind of really just be a simple but bit of a cheaper solution. Just over a billion pounds will go towards introducing simpler fares and faster journeys on local buses using London services as the model. That's part of an existing three billion pound promise. We think that it's not so much of a north-south divide, but there are many areas across the whole country that feel left behind and need levelling up. So areas that have uh, very infrequent bus services, no services in the evenings and the weekends, and these glaring gaps in current provision that need to be addressed. In the lead up to the Chancellor outlining his wider spending plans in a few days' time, we're hearing about lots of these kinds of funding promises. But Rishi Sunak has also spoken about wanting to put the public finances on a sustainable footing. And we should soon find out more about how he intends to do that. Labour has accused the government of lacking a coherent plan and said other projects like delivering HS2 to Leeds were also critical. But the government says modernising the transport network is central to its levelling up agenda. Katie Austin, BBC News in Birmingham. Well, our political correspondent, Nick Erdley, is here with me. Um, as Katie mentioned in that report, the pledges are going to start coming thick and fast, aren't they, before Wednesday? And so is the spending, Clive. So we've had £500 million announced for families. Overnight, an expectation of £850 million for the cultural sector after the pandemic and the billions for transport outside London. We've just heard about the Treasury is emphasising that there is still money to spend. I think we'll hear more about the levelling up agenda on Wednesday. We'll hear more about skills, the government's idea of a higher wage, higher productivity economy. Um, but there are still many in government who are nervous about the economic picture. Remember that the Chancellor has promised to balance the books after the emergency spending of the pandemic. Remember too that there are many worried about inflation and the impact that could have on the cost of borrowing for the government. And remember too that many people at home, many people around the country are really worried about the cost of living as well. Sure. Okay. Nick, many thanks. Nick Early there. 
A prominent advisor to the government on COVID-19 is urging the public to do everything possible to reduce transmission of the virus. Professor Peter Openshaw says infection and death rates are currently unacceptable and he's very fearful there could be another lockdown Christmas. The government maintains at the moment there's no need for stricter COVID measures and is encouraging all those who are eligible to get their booster jabs. With the very latest, here's Eunice Muller. As COVID infection rates continue to increase sharply in England and Wales and remain high across the UK, the heart of the UK's government plans to deal with COVID this winter is getting people vaccinated. At this clinic on the Wirral in Merseyside, rising infections is a concern. I lost my son-in-law last Sunday because he didn't have the vaccines. And the life support was turned off last Sunday. So it's important that everybody, everybody gets the first, second and mainly the booster. Here, they're still trying to persuade some of the five million people who've turned down their first jab. We have vaccinated 80 to 85 percent, but the flip side of the coin is that we have not vaccinated 15 to 20 percent of the population. I think that poses a significant risk. Ryan is getting a jab today for the first time. I just haven't really got around to doing it. I just haven't really given it much thought, to be honest. But uh, she has, my partner's mentioned it a couple of times, like, so I thought I'd best get it done. Hi, folks. I want to... The Prime Minister has launched an advertising campaign for booster jab take up, whilst trying to calm concerns over rising case numbers. Although the government focus remains on vaccinations to deal with this pandemic, ministers are under pressure, with growing calls to go further and act sooner rather than later in introducing extra measures. As hotspots emerge in South Wales and southwest of England, one prominent government advisor has urged the public to do everything possible to reduce transmission of the virus. Do everything possible in your control to try to reduce transmission. Don't wait for the government to change policy. The, the sooner we all act, the sooner we can get this transmission rate down and the greater the prospect of having a Christmas with our families. Average daily hospital admissions in England of people with COVID-19 have climbed up to their highest level for nearly eight months. Combined with the usual winter pressures such as flu, calls for government action may be difficult to ignore. Eunice Muller, BBC News, Wirral. The government's latest coronavirus figures show there were 44,985 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period, which means on average there were 47,680 new cases reported per day in the last week. There were 8,238 people in hospital with COVID as of Thursday. 135 deaths were reported, that's of people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. On average, in the past week, there were 133 deaths announced every day. Court documents in America suggest the actor Alec Baldwin was told a gun was safe moments before he fatally shot a crew member on the set of his new film. He was questioned by police as part of their investigation. The cinematographer, Halina Hutchins, died from a wound to the chest. Ahead of next week's crucial climate summit in Glasgow, the environmental activist Greta Thunberg has called for honesty from world leaders about where they're falling down on combating climate change. Her comments come as Saudi Arabia, the world's biggest oil exporter, says it's aiming to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2060. Greta has been speaking from her home in Sweden to our science correspondent, Rebecca Morell. It was a video that went viral. Greta Thunberg's surprise performance of Rick Astley's 80s hit. It was to launch the Climate Live concerts taking place ahead of the UN climate talks in Glasgow. So what does Greta Thunberg want to tell politicians who are attending COP26? Be honest about where you are, how you have been failing, how you are still failing us, and how they spend their time, instead of trying to find solutions, they seem to spend their time trying to come up with loopholes. Greta Thunberg says the climate meetings are all talk but no action. This was her last month. There is no planet B. There is no planet blah, 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 blah. You've accused politicians of just saying blah, blah, blah. Aren't you just saying blah, blah, blah to, to, to some extent? Yeah. 
But that's the role of an activist to organize marches, to have speeches, to organize events. It's not our job to be politicians. But what does Greta think about becoming the face of climate activism? I don't think people would recognize me in private if they met me. I appear very angry in the media, but I'm not. I'm, I'm too silly in private, a bit too much maybe. So will she ever go back to normal life and stop campaigning? I don't see myself as a climate celebrity. I see myself as a climate activist. After the COP, I don't know, I will go home, uh, go back to school. And of course you can't say, this is the point where I will stop being an activist. Um, it's, it's not black and white like that. She'll be busy for a while yet, as she prepares to join world leaders and head to Glasgow in the coming days. Rebecca Morell, BBC News. Now, with all the sport, here's Lizzie Greenwood-Hughes at the BBC Sports Centre. Hi, Lizzie. Hello, Clive. Thank you. Good evening. The early kickoff in the Premier League today more than lived up to its billing of top v bottom as Chelsea thrashed Norwich seven goals to nil. England's Mason Mount scoring a hat-trick in the goal fest. Joe Linsky reports. Between Chelsea and Norwich City are 20 Premier League places and several hundred million pounds. On paper, the home side would have it easy. On the pitch, they were extraordinary. Mason Mount started the route. Mason Mount, good shot, good goal. Before today, he'd not scored in 25 games. Like him, Callum Hudson-Odoi came through the youth ranks here. This clinical start had been made in Chelsea. The Blues scored a third before half-time, and for Norwich, their top-flight dream is a miserable reality. They have two points and no wins, while Chelsea now were going clear at the top. Chelsea back in business! Now it was a case of how many more to cheer for. Mount would make sure this scoreline would be remembered. First with a penalty, and then a tap-in. Mason Mount's got a hat-trick! It made it 7-0, Chelsea's biggest win for nine years, and a day that showed the mountain between the bottom and the top. Joe Linsky, BBC News. Now, there's only, one, only been one other win so far in the Premier League, and it was Watford who beat Everton 5-2. Hearts are top of the Scottish Premiership. They drew one all with Dundee to overtake Rangers on goal difference. They play tomorrow. Elsewhere, there were wins for Aberdeen, Celtic, Dundee United and Livingston. England's cricketers have had a dream start to the T20 World Cup, easily winning their opening game against the defending champions West Indies. They bowled them out for just 55 in Dubai, then chased it down with six wickets and more than 10 overs to spare. England are hoping to become the first team to hold both the one day and the... ...earlier Australia beat South Africa. There was a clean sweep for England's rugby league sides in their one-off internationals against France. The men's team had to work harder than the 30 points to 10 scoreline suggests, but a flurry of late tries sealed the victory. Stand-in captain John Bateman scoring twice in Perpignan. And before the men's test, on the same pitch, England's women scored seven tries as they cruised to a 40 points to four victory. The team all have full-time jobs and only travelled to France this morning, including having a Covid test at 5am. And the Women's World Cup qualifier between England and Northern Ireland kicked off a few minutes ago at Wembley. It's goalless so far. You can follow what happens on the BBC Sport website. But that's it for me. Back to you, Clive. Lizzie, thank you for that. And that's it. I'll be back with the late news at 10 past 10, now on BBC One. Time for the news where you are. Bye for now.